Welcome to CommercialDrones.fm, the podcast that explores the commercial drone industry, the people who power it, and the concepts that drive it. I'm your host, Ian Smith. Hey everyone, Ian Smith here, and welcome to Commercial Drones FM. Today's episode is the first of what will be a recurring series on this podcast. This series will feed you all the biggest news in the drone industry from the past three months in just 20 minutes. It's called Drone Industry Review. The objective and format of this series is to brief you on all the most important newsworthy items that have happened in the world of drones in the past quarter. Everything from hardware to software, regulations, mergers and acquisitions, delivery drones, entertainment drones, and more will be covered. So are you ready? I sure hope so. Here's your drone industry review for quarter one, 2017. Kicking it off with hardware, we'll start with multi-rotors. They're still the go-to platform of choice for most commercial drone operations. And here are the major players. DJI. DJI announced their Matrice 200 platform, which is targeted at enterprise customers and commercial use cases. They're still going strong with the Inspire 2 and Phantom 4 Pro lines of drones. And on the tail end of Q1 2017, we saw the first rumors of what will be the tiny DJI Spark Nano Drone. Unique announced their Typhoon H520 at CES early on in the year. It's also targeted at commercial end users and is similar to the Typhoon H Pro with retractable landing gear and foldable arms. It's capable of up to 31 minute flight times and has options for dual thermal and RGB cameras at the same time on the drone. Autel Robotics. Autel is having trouble and laid off US-based sales and marketing staff, but did announce two new camera modules for their X-Star series of drones and a software development kit. Arion Labs. The high-end quadcopter OEM announced a partnership with drone software provider Drone Deploy, and their Skyranger multi-rotor platform did complete the first approved Canadian Beyond Visual line of sight flight. Moving on to Fixed Wing. Fixed wing drones are still expensive and still not incredibly user friendly or versatile for most applications, but they are making headway. French fixed wing OEM Delairtec purchased Trimble's Gatewing business. They're now over 100 employees and they've tripled their turnover with over $7 million in annual revenue. Sensefly, who not only make fixed wing EB drones, but also the Albrus Multirotor, the drone formerly known as Exom are further enhancing the EB line and are the undisputed heavyweight champ of fixed wing OEMs, still leading the fixed wing category. They received the first Swiss approval for any time beyond visual line of sight operations for their EB aircraft, and Sensefly also partnered with Micasense for cloud processing and agrobotics for distribution. VTOL, or vertical takeoff and landing. These are drones that take off and land vertically, but transition to horizontal flight during cruise for increased efficiency. They're not yet proven, but much hyped. AeroVironment entered the commercial market this quarter with their Quantix drone, a VTOL platform with 45 minutes of endurance, 400 acre field coverage, and dual 18 megapixel RGB and multispectral sensors. No word yet on price, but expect it not to be cheap. Autel Robotics is also working on a VTOL platform called the Kestrel with the maximum takeoff weight of 31 pounds and an endurance of two hours. Will this drone signal the second coming of the ailing company? Sensors. Sony and FLIR are both crushing the sensor game, and the majority of sensors are from these two OEMs right now. It's safe to say today that most drones flying with an RGB camera have a sensor made by Sony. Speaking of RGB cameras, big zooms are trending. 30x zoom sensors from Sony are in Arion Lab Sky Ranger drones, as well as the new Z30 sensor from DJI, which are being used on Matrice 200 and Inspire 2 drones. Thermal. FLIR is spreading courtesy of DJI. The company makes thermal imaging accessible to the masses with this partnership. Photogrammetry is still not mastered across the board with radiometric TIFF imagery because of non-standard file types and complexities, stitching not just visual data but temperature data as well. Coupling that with typical fisheye lenses found on thermal sensors and firmware issues, it's been tough for thermal to get traction. Multispectral sensors are coming in hot this grow season. Parrot previously partnered with Micasense to produce the Sequoia sensor. Slant Range released their new and improved 3P multispectral sensor, and Micasense also has their own product line of Red Edge cameras. 
Sentera is another multispectral sensor producer, and they announced real-time NDVI streaming, turning your video FPV feed into an NDVI image, but who knows how useful that is. Hyperspectral is still way too expensive, heavy, and nobody knows how to properly use the data yet, but startups like Carbon B from France are trying to make lower cost hyperspectral sensors available to the masses. Headwall and other manufacturers that make hyperspectral sensors are still unattainable for the average commercial drone operator. LiDAR. Velodyne is leading the way with their Puck LiDAR and recently opened a mega factory in San Jose, California for large scale production of 3D LiDAR sensors. Velodyne's Harris Wang joined me on a previous episode of Commercial Drones FM number 30 for a LiDAR 101 lesson. Laser methane detectors are not popular at all yet, but there's a huge opportunity here for oil and gas leak detection. Battery and power plant technology. Solar panels are increasing in efficiency, but make sense only really for fixed wing aircraft. Devin Humphreys with Flightline Geographics joined me on a very early episode of Commercial Drones FM number four and talked about how his Hawkeye UAV system can nearly fly for unlimited distances in perfect conditions as the solar panels on that fixed wing platform generate more power than it consumes. LiPo technology has no big advancements with efficiency gains really coming at the software and other hardware component levels. Hydrogen fuel cells are not really catching on yet. They give that mythical mega endurance of hours upon hours. So we'll have to wait further to see what happens on those fronts. Software. Software is a bit more challenging to talk about, so naturally it will be quicker to run through. Data integrations will be key for enterprise adoption of drones. Machine learning, computer vision, and artificial intelligence are huge. Companies like TensorFlight and Cogniac can identify nearly anything you want from drone imagery, and many industries will benefit from this. Drone Deploy is doing a great job leading the way with their drone data app market, where the aforementioned companies and many others release software augmentations for Drone Deploy users to automatically count trees, cars, plants, generate automated roof reports, and much more. One challenge with software is that there needs to be more historical data of drone use to make it more useful for applications like machine learning. And we used to say big data before it was actually truly big data. We're getting closer, but we're still not there yet. Reports are a big deal. Standalone maps don't say much. Software that generates something you can share with a colleague or client that tells you what steps to take after flying the drone are starting to materialize this quarter. Stemming from the historical data tracking and graphs leads to trends and ultimately prediction. And lastly, one fairly new player of note to the drone software arena is an Austin-based company called Hangar that's co-founded by ex-DJI, ex-3D Robotics, Colin Gwynn. Regulations. Here we'll focus mainly on the US market and the FAA. A question. Flights over people. When are they going to be allowed without a waiver? The answer? Not yet. This quarter, the FAA quietly retracted Section 333 closed set exemptions, as I talked about with podcast guest Gretchen West of Hogan Levels in episode number 39. Another question. Beyond visual line of sight. When? Still a ways to go, but as you heard earlier, other countries like Canada, Switzerland, and France have been leading the way. Night operations are also still a challenge without a waiver, and drones over 55 pounds, drones greater than 55 pounds, will be big, no pun intended, and currently not many people are thinking about them, but likely because they will require special exemptions to operate commercially currently. The FAA released their aerospace forecast for 2017 to 2037 report. They estimate that over the next five years, there will be more than 3.5 million hobbyist drones and 420,000 commercial drones in the United States. There are currently more than 770,000 drones registered to fly in the US, gaining 100,000 plus users in just three months from January to March 2017. Insane growth. Shakeups, funding, and mergers and acquisitions. Iris Automation raised one and a half million bucks to help drones sense and avoid obstacles, as I talked about with co-founder Alex Harmson in episode number 41 of the podcast. Parrot fired one third of their entire drone team, which is 33%, now pivoting focus to the commercial industry. GoPro re-released the Karma after the huge goof up where the drone was launched and then recalled just days later. 
and you can hear the entire backstory on the GoPro Karma drones crashing back to Earth in episode number 40 of the podcast. Lily Robotics fell spectacularly out of the sky in a ball of somewhat well-deserved flames. They were sued by the city of San Francisco, and investigations are underway. Apparently, they're trying to get people their money back for the Kickstarter drone that never took off. Autel Robotics fired most of their sales and marketing team in the United States, and Alphabet's Google X gave up on their high-altitude, long-endurance internet drone, and also had some internal shuffling within the delivery drone arm Project Wing, losing Dave Voss, the project's lead. Airbus may soon join drone industry leaders with their own homegrown drone service offering based out in Atlanta, Georgia, with ex-Airware employee JC Kalman at the helm. Caterpillar invested in Airware to bring drone tech to mining and construction enterprises, and John Deere's construction arm, not the agriculture arm, partnered with Kespri to bring drones and aerial data to construction and forestry. Autonomy. This section discusses the drones in a box concepts that fly autonomously every day, return to their box to charge, and then do it all again the next day. No human required. Aerobotics, an Israeli company which specializes in drones in a box, received certification for commercial operations from the Israeli government. They currently operate strictly in Australia and Israel. Drones in a box are expensive and regulations hamper them in the US, and that makes the attraction of the fully autonomous value proposition a bit out of reach since you need a human pilot available to take control at any time, and you cannot currently operate drones beyond visual line of sight yet in the United States. Fully autonomous drone economics are not quite there yet, but I suspect will soon be. AR, VR, and wearables. Construction stands to benefit largely from these technologies. Companies like Daiquiri, Epson, and Realware are making useful hardware wearables that enable AR and VR technology to be used with drone data. Imagine wearing a pair of these AR glasses, being on a job site, and getting your drone data of the day beamed to those smart glasses and having the latest volumetric data overlaid in digital augmented reality on top of the stockpile you happen to glance at or submit a construction RFI by voice, have it geotagged, synced to site plans, and get that as an annotation that's synced into your drone data platform of choice. That's a huge construction drone value chain. Or even beyond drones, having every construction worker equipped with smart glasses that take a picture every 30 seconds, which gets beamed directly into a cloud-based photogrammetric suite for processing, with the result being a fully reconstructed 3D construction site model that's generated from the inside out every single day. You heard it here first. These wearables can even help give you increased situational awareness while operating your drone, overlaying a visual of airspace or nearby air traffic in front of your eyes. I'm incredibly bullish on this technology, playing a big role in the coming years as drones permeate job sites. Delivery drones. They're still hampered by regulations in the US, but the leaders right now for non-medical deliveries are Amazon, working on Prime Air in the UK, Google, reorganizing their Project Wing project with no big news lately, Flirty, who are keeping busy with publicity stunts like delivering pizza, Matternet, with an odd Mercedes-Benz partnership that seems light years ahead of our current reality, and Starship Technologies, who are doing terrestrial, ground-based drone food delivery in San Francisco. Hey, it's still a drone, right? Internet beaming drones. Facebook's large Aquila drone will soon be launching a couple of test flights per month. Google canceled their internet drone called Project Titan and reappropriated the employees to other projects within the company. And AT&T puts cows in the sky to beam LTE coverage where it's needed. Okay, that's a bad headline. Cow is telecom conglomerate speak for sell on wheels, and the purpose is to give internet connectivity during times of disaster or during large events. Cool. Entertainment drones. Intel, who made the famous Super Bowl drone light show swarm happen, was recently seen posting jobs to hire a drone light show designer and BD folks for their entertainment drone division. And a record-setting 1,000 drone light show swarm was accomplished by the company Ehang in China. Eventually, entertainment drones are going to be a large subset of the drone industry and are something pretty much anybody can enjoy. 
And it won't just be light shows, but actual moving props suspended in air, coming to a super trendy LA mansion party near you in 2018. Watch this space. The mining industry. Not a lot to say here. Drones are increasingly useful at mines and quarries, aggregate tracking and calculation of volumes, blasting operation planning and analysis, and general overview of the site in general. Airware acquired Redbird and got the strategic investment we spoke of earlier from Caterpillar. Of note are a couple past podcast episodes where I had Emmanuel, who's the ex-CEO of Redbird, on the podcast for episode number 18, and Buddy Machini, Airware's current CTO, on episode number 37. The Redbird acquisition gave Airware a huge strategic advantage in the mining industry, and this means Kespri, one of Airware's main competitors, is definitely on high alert. The construction industry. They're going through a technological renaissance. There are so many construction startups popping up right now. Construction stands to benefit from drones more than nearly any other industry right now. Embracing drone technology is the younger generation coming into the construction game, many of which work in the VDC and BIM departments of these construction companies. Asset tracking and integration of data for superintendents to track site projects and analytics is a huge benefit and useful at every stage in the construction process. One of my favorite startups that will be working more and more with drone data that was starting to get active this past quarter is called Project Atlas. the agriculture industry. This is always a tough one, and what this industry really needs is more algorithmic analysis and sensor capability, plus buckets of historical data so they can start developing trends and predictions for their crops. Computer vision and machine learning played a large part in drawing out more useful data for farmers, like automatically counting plants and trees by companies like AgriSense, or calculating and quantifying the monetary impact of damage to crops by companies like Skymatics. This past quarter, businesses like Drone Deploy were increasingly integrating with existing ag software suites like John Deere, AgX by SST, and others to make it as easy as possible for farmers and growers to get their data from drone to combine. The surveying industry. Surveying is tied closely to hardware. RTK, or real-time kinematics, gives large efficiency and accuracy gains in some cases, but drones from popular OEMs like DJI have RTK modules that are available on their platforms which don't yet geotag pictures for some reason, something that's required to truly make use of the benefits of RTK or PPK for surveying. In the meantime, Sensefly's EB has been chugging along with working RTK for photogrammetric surveying missions for quite some time. The cell tower industry. This industry is big. AT&T alone has over 60,000 cell towers to monitor. And using drones for cell tower inspection has huge value, but it's a tough job for photogrammetry and is still much better suited for still imagery and high res, big zoom video cameras like the popular 30X optical zoom ones from Sony. To learn more about this industry, you can check out a past episode with AT&T's Art Pregler on the podcast number 36, where we dove deep into all the ways that telecom companies can use drones for inspection and general work. The utilities industry. This past quarter, drones were being used for wind turbine inspections, solar panel inspection using RGB and thermal cameras, and even oil and gas. A note on hardware for this industry that will make these jobs easier is the Matrice 200 series which DJI recently announced. The company even released a hell of a promo video which showcases the M200 as being ideal for the utilities industry. So nearly all of these six previously mentioned industries have comprehensive reports that you can get yourself from commercial UAV news. I personally was able to contribute insight to their construction industry report. So if you want, check these reports out and go to expouav.com slash free dash reports dash 2017. I'll go ahead and link that up in the Commercial Drones FM website on the show notes for this episode as well. And that's it. In less than 20 minutes, Q1 2017 of the drone industry is in the books. I hope you enjoyed this drone industry review 
and we'll release the next one in July of 2017. Be sure to check out past episodes of Commercial Drones FM on the website, commercialdrones.fm, or wherever you get your podcasts from. If you want to support the podcast, head to patreon.com slash drones podcast. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash drones podcast and see how just $1 a month can keep this show going and get you access to the exclusive Commercial Drones FM supporters only Slack group. Hope to see you there. All right, let's cut off the mics. Cheers. Cheers.